In December 2011, Farming Smarter held its annual conference and trade show at the Lethbridge Lodge Hotel, bringing together over 250 agricultural professionals and over 20 speakers. The conference served to educate members of the farming community on growing trends, opportunities, and issues facing today's agricultural industry. We now take you to the Farming Smarter Conference to view the presentation of our speakers. I'd like, first like to thank the organizers for inviting me here today. And what my biography doesn't tell you about me is that I love disease. And I know many of you do not. <laughs> but it, I always tell farmers it's good that you have people like me um, that you paid to help you. So uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of diseases that we've been dealing with the last few years in Montana um, and across the U.S. Uh, we have our primary wheat growing region is the Great Plains, and I've been doing quite a bit of work with um, the Great Plains Diagnostic Network and National Plant Diagnostic Network to map and uh, these diseases uh, so we can provide modeling tools for farmers to predict these diseases um, so we, they won't have as big of an impact on our farm. Um, talk about some experiences, um, a couple of projects I've been involved in both from the research side and the extension side. And then talk a little bit about how we work together to prevent or limit these diseases. Uh, I also call this, I know what to do, but does my neighbor and how do I get him to change his behavior? And I, I don't have any good answers. I'll just, just give away the punchline. Um, uh, thank a few organizations, NPDN, GPDN. Um, the two people pictured there are Carla Thomas and Len Coop, who did the degree day modeling and mapping. Um, there's also Linnea Skoglin, who's looking at diseases. She's uh, my disease diagnostician and pretty much runs the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. There's also my research crew there. Um, we sprayed about two and a half, three miles of wheat viruses a year. Um, and in extension, you know, a lot of these tools, you know, you feel like a superhero a lot of days. You're on the phone talking to farmers, you give them real answers. Um, but most days, it's a grind, sometimes literally. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about a couple diseases today, uh, weed streak mosaic virus and striped rust. Both of these diseases are community diseases. They uh, are facilitated by the green bridge. So the green bridge is the presence of green plant material between the harvesting of one crop and the planting of the next. Um, in our case, we have quite a bit of winter wheat overlapping with spring wheat. So we'll either get late maturing spring wheat where the disease moves into the early planted winter wheat, um, or we get volunteer winter wheat either due to sawfly, to hail, or ver various other reasons. And then the disease moves from the winter wheat into the volunteer and then carries over into the new crop. Uh, weed streak mosaic virus is a mite, wheat curl mite transmitted virus, uh, and it is eliminated if you eliminate the green bridge. So if you can eliminate that green plant material, this is not a problem. Uh, the factors complicating this are that we have two fairly newly identified viruses that you cannot distinguish from wheat streak based on symptoms, and they're also both transmitted by the wheat curl mite. These are known as triticum mosaic virus, which was identified in 2006, and high plains virus, which was identified probably in 93. Um, both of these, all these viruses uh, can live in all cereal crops, so corn, wheat, rye, um, and they also live in grassy weeds. Um, so, um, like cheatgrass can, can facilitate that green bridge. Uh, last fall, I thought wheat streak was going to be my disease of the year in 2011 because it was very, very widespread across Montana. And in this map, the red counties were po tested positive for wheat streak mosaic virus. I met with about six growers um, the following spring, this, this spring in May, um, where the, one of the neighbors had late maturing spring wheat, and especially the early planted winter wheat had severe virus problems. Um, we spent a day looking at some fields. Um, this field also had a bit of a, a damping off problem. Um, uh, but in, in that case, um, you know, it was a community disease. Uh, that one neighbor um, probably will take uh, the plant, the, the um, growers in that area are planting a little later. Luckily, we, we did have a very extended um, dry fall. So it wasn't great for the growers this year because the wheat didn't emerge, but it was great for the disease because 
um, the disease is not going to be a problem because there wasn't that green bridge in, that, in the triangle, which is our primary wheat, winter wheat growing re region. Uh, we've done a, a great deal of research and found that it's highly associated with cheatgrass. Cheatgrass is a winter annual weed. It emerges all year long um, and then overwinters and then um, in the spring can exceed uh, winter wheat. It'll, it'll green up earlier than winter wheat and then it can host the mite also and then the mite moves the virus into um, the winter wheat crop. This is generally a primary inoculum. If the d volunteer in that, that field is not controlled for an additional year, they'll have a very serious problem. But um, it, it, cheatgrass isn't the best host for either the virus or the mite, but it can be a very good reservoir uh, for this disease. But luckily in Montana, I don't think this is going to be an issue in future years. We've been breeding sheep to control cheatgrass, and they're very effective. Um, unfortunately, they only work one day a year on Halloween. Uh, in the case of wheat streak, there are no chemical methods to control the disease. Uh, these, this is a list of insecticides or acaricides that have been suggested. Um, the one product that had some efficacy was furidan. That was delisted by the Environmental Protection Agency as of January of 2010. Um, so that's no longer a method. Um, Lorsban, and, Lorsban is a foliar. Um, Clopyrifos. Um, it's not labeled for wheat curl mite. It might kill some of the mites that are on the leaf that it directly contacts, but it can't get the mites that are down in the whorl of the plant hiding. Um, these mites, are, they're called the wheat curl mite because they curl the leaf to protect themselves, and they like that, that high humidity environment that it provides, and the insecticides can't get in there. Uh, so Lors Band's not an option. Uh, seed treatments, including gaucho and cruiser, are also not eff effective. Um, in fact, um, gaucho, which is imidacloprid, is actually increases wheat curl mite populations. Um, when I told this to our greenhouse manager, he said that he'd been spraying um, a produ the product imidacloprid as a foliar on the wheat for like 10 years, and they were always wondering why we had a wheat curl mite problem, and it was not the virologist's fault at all. We never had a problem. It was the breeders. So um, he, th that was one part of perpetuating that problem, and he's going to be finding other products for thrips and aphid control. Oberon is a product that in the U.S. it's not labeled for wheat yet, um, but we might have a section three next year. We've done some efficacy trials with that, um, but it, it, um, it we had very spotty efficacy. In fact, as we increased the rate of Oberon, we increased wheat curl mites in general, so that was not um, a really good result. Um, so eliminating the green bridge is the only way to control wheat curl mite transmitted viruses at this time. This is a regional problem. Uh, in 2006, I attended a meeting of the National Plant Diagnostic Network, and as we were going around the table of the Great Plains region, everyone stood up and said, oh, wheat viruses were a problem in my state this year. Wheat viruses are a big problem in my state this year. And so I got to thinking, like, oh, this is cool. You know, I could maybe look at um, inc uh, prevalence and species across the state, uh, across the region. And it just happened that in 2006 was the first year that we'd identified triticum mosaic virus, and we didn't know where it was outside of the Kansas state border. So this um, was a really good opportunity for us to show how we could work together and get some good data to help our growers. We didn't know why viruses were so high that year. Um, it could have been host. We have some resistance, but it's not widely deployed and it is temperature sensitive. There could have been changes in vector. We knew there were changes in the pathogen populations and always we're worried about the change in climate. Um, we do know that CO2 can affect um, virus reproduction um, and it could affect uh, mite reproduction as well. <clears throat> so we did a survey of all nine states in the Great Plains region um, on samples submitted to the diagnostic lab. So these are, this is a biased sampling, it's not a random survey. Um, these are samples that people were concerned about, so we just captured a snapshot of what was happening in each state each year. They came into the diagnostic lab and each diagnostician processed these with ELISA. So as I said, we couldn't tell which virus it was just by looking at the plant, but if we do uh, this immunosorbent assay, we can identify which virus it is. And we know that if we have co-infections of say wheat streak with high plains or triticum, we have greater symptom severity and yield loss. So we hope to um, identify co-infections as well as single infections. 
In 2010, 2011, we actually fed this into a degree day model that we've been developing um, just to get an estimate of when diagnosticians would see symptoms showing up. And I'll show you an example in just a moment. But uh, on these maps, the um, colors represent the degree days or the amount of warmness in the environment. So you can see Texas is much warmer than Montana on that date. Um, it has the yellow color. Um, and then we predicted where the virus would show up within the next couple of weeks based on what the degree days were. So this is just one snapshot. Um, in the box is our May 4th prediction of where viruses would start showing up based on the degree day model. The green counties are tested but negative. The red counties are tested at N positive. And you can see that just a few days later, um, we did have virus show up um, in uh, one of our areas that we had predicted. And we saw this repeatedly. So um, we're further refining, refining those models and they'll be available on the uspest.org website next year. So uh, extension specialists such as myself will be able to go to the uspest.org website and predict where viruses are gonna be showing up. Um, this is just a summary of the three years of, that we did the survey. We had anywhere from 700 to 1,000 samples per year. Wheat streak was the most predominant virus identified, but we did identify triticum and high plains in every single state that was surveyed, which was important information. Um, and we also found that the barley yellowdwarf virus, we surveyed for the barley yellowdwarf viruses also, but those were fairly minimal from year to year. Um, as a result of this survey, high plains and triticum are not regulated pests, so researchers can work with them. Um, the germplasm was used for several research projects, which I'm not going to talk about today, um, but we formed a collaborative group um, that is very strong, and we, are, we have plans um, to submit some proposals to develop forecasting models to help growers predict um, virus incidents on their farm and prioritize their management um, based on their risk. Uh, this is a baseline of data to measure changes in populations uh, in future years, whether it's a result of climate change or varieties or whatever. We've also done quite extensive um, educational campaigns in Nebraska, Montana, Texas, and developed lots of materials on wheat viruses and provided um, experiential learning for students. Uh, I'd like to switch talk, topics uh, abruptly and talk about striped rust because this is the first year I've received calls from Canada. Um, about early July, I started um, getting calls from consultants in southern Canada asking me about striped rust. And this was a banner year for fungal diseases in general and striped rust in particular. This is a spore cloud of striped rust. Um, this was captured with... Um, one of the growers droids and he saw this weird thing on the horizon he took a picture luckily um, uh, and you can see the the orange uh, on the horizon um, so this is how much stripe rust we were having um, there, were, there were a combination of factors we had widespread fall infection last fall we had a very extended fall so it was warm we had a lot of early planted winter wheat um, we had favorable spring temperatures and quite a bit of not only moisture but flooding that kept the humidity high throughout the state for the majority of the year. Even after the daytime temperatures turned hot and the rain turned off in mid-June, we still had nighttime temperatures that were very favorable for infection, which is 50 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we had a widely planted and now susceptible variety, Genou. Um, it is now susceptible because we have new strains in the state um, that have overcome the resistance in Janu and that also can um, replicate at higher temperatures than old strains and they overwinter very well. They're much more competitive than the old strains. And we also knew that in April that Washington State was having a, a banner year for stripe rust as well. So we had extensive fall infection. This is some, some pictures from um, a sample submitted to the diagnostic lab. And you think of stripe rust as occurring in stripes, but in the fall, when the temperatures are cool, um, you're just gonna get these little yellow dots. It's not gonna occur in stripes. So if you suspect stripe rust and want it confirmed, um, send it to your diagnostic lab or just send a picture. You can even just email it to me and I'll, I'll help you out. Uh, it was throughout the Golden Triangle. The, um, this is basically the Golden Triangle of Montana, the winter wheat growing region. Um, and these are only confirmed, the red counties. Um, I'm sure it was in Hill County as well. Um, 
uh, so it was in their primary winter wheat growing region. Um, by 20th June, which is just a few days before that picture, we had it throughout the state. Um, in areas where I generally do not see stripe rust, um, it was very, very severe. So here's some of the reasons that we had stripe rust. Normally that's wheat, and I think you could take a jet ski on that. Um, here's Janu. Um, this field turned from trace to orange in about four days. Uh, in this field in particular, we were driving up and the road was all rutted, the field road, and I'm like, God, can't this guy you know, maintain his field road? And once I met the producer, I knew that it wasn't the producer's fault, and so I asked him, and he said that there, there were so many springs popping up from all the moisture from the hillside that his road, he couldn't keep up on the road maintenance, so um, he could barely get up there. Um, this is the producer. I'd like everybody to know he has white pants on. Uh, and as we were walking through the field, I was like, oh, this is cool, you know, look at it on our boots. And he's like, what? So um, those are the opportunities where I, I try to contain my excitement, but I'm not really all that <laughs> successful. Um, you can see it powdered on the ground. Um, he had sprayed that field the day previous to when we visited. And so I came up like, oh, man, is this even worth spraying? And, and then the consultant was right there, and, I'm, and they're like, oh, we sprayed it yesterday. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, so this is one of, a, one of his fields from afar as we're driving towards it. You can see the orange color. Fungicides were used very extensively in the state and were quite effective. Uh, this is an aerial view. Um, on the left is the fungicide treated area of the field and on the right is where no fungicide was applied. Um, variety resistance is very effective at reducing yield losses. Um, in fact, uh, this is my main recommendation for stripe rust, is to grow a resistant variety. The problem we run into, into Montana is that we have a very big problem with wheat stem sawfly, and the best variety for, yellow, for Yellowstone for, for stripe rust tolerance is susceptible to sawfly. So that's why they're growing Janu, which is susceptible to stripe rust. So pick your, pick your pest. Um, on the left is a susceptible, susceptible variety. You can recognize it because it has those very active orange sporulating pustules. And on the right is a resistant variety. You might see some pustules, but then you'll see these tan lesions, and you'll see black spots appear, which is a terminal stage for stripe rust. So um, if you see that resistance, don't spray. It's not worth it. Um, the, another problem we ran into was that the temperatures were so cool this spring that even Yellowstone showed quite a bit of symptoms and it was sprayed quite frequently. Um, our resistant varieties have what we call high temperature adult plant resistance, so you won't see that resistance kick in until the temperatures are um, above like 75, 80 Fahrenheit and they're past jointing. So we didn't see the resistance start to kick in until late June. Um, this is a demonstration. Um, on the left is a susceptible variety, CDC Falcon, and on the right is Yellowstone. You can just see the line right down the middle of the field. Um, so, th and this is uh, late June when that resistance is kicking in. This is a fungicide spray I did in 2006 when we had another epidemic uh, with a slightly different strain. But on the left is a susceptible variety called Big Sky, and on the right is Yellowstone, which is resistant. And um, this is yield losses. Uh, with no fungicide applied, fungicide, uh, in this case a full rate of quilt, which is a blend of a strobilian and a trizol, at tillering, which was disease onset, and then I sprayed at boot and I sprayed at flowering. So any time I sprayed that susceptible variety, I got about a 10 bushel yield increase. So if you have a susceptible variety and you have stripe rust, you need to spray. If you have a resistant variety, such as Yellowstone, I do not recommend spraying at all. Um, because any time I sprayed, I did not get any yield response. So Yellowstone, um, I think it may be increasing acreage in Canada as well. Um, it does have some problems with tan spot and septoria, um, so you also need to factor that into the equation. But if stripe rust is your main issue, I do still do not recommend spraying Yellowstone. We had quite a bit of late applied fungicides. Um, what we call rescue spraying. And what I want you to take home is that if, if it's past flowering, um, you don't want to spray because your economic return is going to be much less. It generally is not economical. This is data from, um, I think, uh, yeah, Bob Hunger in Oklahoma. And this is leaf rust, not stripe rust, but um, 
on the top axis is the severity of leaf rust on the flag leaf and then the growth stage. So about the last time you can spray wheat is flowering because of that pre-harvest interval. You have to stop spraying within 30 days of harvest. Um, and after that, you, you may have pesticide residue. So if you spray it flowering and say you have 40% leaf rust on your flag leaf, you can get an economic benefit about 20%. But if you wait and spray, spray at milk, you're only gonna get about 8% benefit. So the later you spray, the less economic benefit you're gonna have. I know striper rust is gonna be an issue in Alberta next year, so you need to scout your fields and if you see it and you have a susceptible variety, you need to consider a fungicide application. If you have a resistant variety, you do not. But this is, just emphasizes the importance of getting into your fields as often as you can and looking at the wheat, getting out of the truck um, and picking up some plants. And if you see something, ask some questions. Um, in Montana, we, I did a survey um, and uh, it represented about half a million acres. So. Um, and we have about five million acres of wheat, so it's a fairly good representation of the state. Um, I calculated that Montana growers spend about $15 million on fungicide applications this year. A lot of that was aerial. We couldn't get enough planes in to spray. Um, fungicide save growers probably about $30 million. Yield losses, cost, yield losses with no spray or a, an ill-timed sprayed co cost growers about $48 million. And not spraying resistant varieties saved about $12 million. So this had a very serious economic impact. So the, the real core why I was asked to come here was um, talk about a little bit about community diseases. I talked about two that are important in Montana, wheat viruses and stripe rust. Um, for stripe rust, you know, we had that warm fall, which I think is the, or the dry fall, which I think is the best thing that could have happened to us because we eliminated that green bridge in the triangle. There are a lot of other parts of the state, though, that had a lot of prevent plant from that flooding. They got their winter wheat in as early as possible. So those are going to be my stripe rust hotspots next year. Um, I was in Jordan in October, and the wheat was about that tall. So um, I'm going to be looking for it there the next spring. Um, we know what to do. Um, if you don't know what to do, you ask your consultant. But how do we get our neighbors to pay attention? You know, guys with 40,000 acres or something. Um, I don't have an answer. And if, if you have an answer, I, please come up to me and talk to me at lunch. Um, but I think a lot of it is, is coffee shops. Um, you yourself becoming educated and speaking up. And if you have any questions, there are professionals that can answer those questions. There are websites. Um, in Montana, I have an egg alert system. Um, and I email growers and I also fax them if they don't have email just to keep them updated on what's happening in the state. Um, this year, the, the story was evolving so rapidly. There was one day I think I spent, sent like three or four egg alerts and I was really, really tempted to say, send one last one, say, are you sick of me yet? You know, you try, try and keep them updated. Um, and those egg alerts are used in newspapers, newsletters, radio, television. Um, we try to get the word out as best as we can, um, just so, it, but if you find something in your field, um, I encourage growers in Montana to send samples to me so I can let everybody else know in the area so that the entire community um, can know about it and talk about it. But a lot of the information about stripe rust um, was from egg alerts. I found from my survey, um, if the consultants were using egg alerts to get their information about stripe rust and the growers were getting their information from the consultants or egg alerts. So um, th those egg alerts were really key in getting um, unbiased information out. Um, we know there's a lot of biased information, um, but to try and get um, the, the information out, we try, the, the people at the university and extension try as best we can. Um, so, and, and if you have any feedback, I'd be happy to, to hear you. Um, anybody uh, have any keys to success for getting their neighbor to follow farming practices? Uh, okay. Well, I'll leave you with one last thought, is that I think our jobs as, as both uh, in academia and in our home is to train, train our, our, our children um, about these diseases, how, or, or about your farm, about anything. Um, and this is my daughter. Um, and, uh, our, our goal is to train the next generation. Um, so I, I fully expect someone in my position um, in 30 years to be on the phone saying this exact same thing. What part of Greenbridge don't you understand? Uh, I did a survey um, and I found that 
like 65% of the guys that I surveyed didn't know what the Green Bridge were. Um, and then another audience, 100% knew. So uh, um, really um, teaching people that they need to look at their crop um, and think about all the factors, not only nutrients and crop rotations and everything, but, but thinking about it globally um, as well as, as our neighbors. And we all help each other to succeed. Any questions? Uh, the research station recommended that they seed later, and yes, um, that does help eliminate the green bridge. Um, in the case of the viruses, that's really, really important because they're mostly local. They're on farm or w within a very narrow area. With stripe rust, um, it's windborne, um, so it's definitely going to help you not have a fall infection in your field. Um, but next year, you still have to be careful because any one guy that's seeded early a susceptible variety is going to infect the whole, the whole area. So um, that's where you have to all work together to eliminate that green bridge. Um, and there are other tools, there are fungicides, varieties, and everything, but a lot of that is um, paying attention to the cultural aspects. Uh, it's, it, we were talking this morning, um, and our spring wheat breeders are breeding for delayed green. And I'm really excited about that because it's awesome for you know a green bridge. I'm, we're going to have monster virus problems and stripe rust with you know once these things are um, widely deployed. So we have to think about our whole our cropping system as a whole, um, which often we don't do. Yeah, the question is what the difference is between stripe rust, leaf rust. There are actually three main rusts, leaf rust, stripe rust, and stem rust. Um, they're different pathogens, they're different species. So stripe rust I think of as our cool season rust. It likes 50 to 70 degrees, um, high moisture. It's going to be that early season stuff. Leaf rust um, blows up from usually Texas in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> so if they have a good rust year, we can expect rust to come in, leaf rust to come in late. Um, Usually it's not an issue, um, but it's more of a warm. It likes that 85-ish in high humidity. Um, it's a problem in our irrigated production on the eastern side of the state, um, but it uh, comes in so late, it's generally not an issue. Um, stem rust, um, since we had barberry eradication around World War II um, and we have resistance in our varieties, we generally don't have a problem with it. Um, but I do know that Yellowstone is very susceptible to stem rust um, because I use it in my stem rust trials. So, but um, I don't know if you guys have heard of UG99 stem rust from Africa. Um, that is a strain of stem rust that's overcoming the resistance in our varieties. So our breeders, I'm sure in Canada too, are sending our varieties overseas to Africa to get tested so that we can develop resistance before we get that pathogen in the U.S., if we ever do. All right, thank you very much.